We have the beautiful Daisy Lopez with us today and I'm so excited to talk to her because we connected a few months ago and immediately just had such a resonance and was so on the same page of so many things with you and just really felt like, oh, this is this is my person. <laughs> like I really connected with you in such a beautiful way and I'm just so excited for everybody else to get to hear and connect with you as well. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It was kind of like, how have we only just met now? <laughs> like yes. we just kind of like went right into sharing our stories and, and it really kind of feels like we've been, our journeys are different, but we've kind of been led through this like pruning process over the past year and really having to turn back inward and heal. And it just felt so good to align with somebody that is on the other side of the world. Cause I'm here in Miami, <laughs> yeah. Florida. But um, yeah, there was just that beautiful resonance there. And, you know, you came on my podcast and everything that you shared was just so honest and relevant. And I'm excited for that to come out. But it's such an honor to be here with your peeps and your space. So thank Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. And so I would love to just hear a little bit about what you do. And also, I know that you use human design in your world. And so how has that impacted your work as well? Yeah. So I always kind of tell people like I do marketing, but it's not the marketing that you think. (laughs) Because I know when people hear marketing, they're like, oh my gosh, this girl's going to give me a content calendar. This girl's (laughs) going to like give me hashtag strategy. Um, And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I have just cultivated this deep belief that marketing is a liberation tool. Mm. And it's been so true in my own evolution. I grew up first generation Cuban American and very much afraid to speak up in any capacity. I have literally walked this earth for 20 plus years, believing that I'm just not seen, that uh, it's unsafe for me to be fully seen. And that really was developed because with you know, just the the history of my family, like they're a big part of their survival moving into a completely new country. A lot of the conditioning was, you know, don't make yourself too known. Like it's not safe. Just stay, stay in your own path. Just put your head down and work and don't call too much attention to yourself. Um, don't let people know too much about you. They're going to use that against you, right? It was that kind of like, it's us versus them. Mm. Uh, and there's also a sentence in Spanish that literally translates to you look prettier when you're quiet. Wow. So it's just, a, it's such a miracle that I'm able to run this business and even speak here today. The fact that I've been able to, you know, speak in other spaces and just creatively express myself. Marketing has really done that for me. If it wasn't for marketing, I don't think I ever would have stepped into this version of myself. And to take it a step further, marketing has the power to unify us. When we use marketing to to use it to spread bigger messages that can bring us all together, that can allow us to see different perspectives, can allow our communities to see themselves in the greater messaging of our brands. It's an incredible tool. And it's unfortunate that it's been mischaracterized as a manipulation tool. But through the different elements of my work, I look to reestablish that relationship between visionaries, entrepreneurs, and marketing so that they can grow their bigger movements while also bringing their full expression to the table. But mm. yeah, going back to human design, I mean, I I learned it selfishly for me. Yeah. <laughs> I was, when was it? It must have been like end of 2021. I was so burnt out. And, and it, interestingly enough, like I have had several run-ins with burnout I was in the corporate space for a few years and like that was incredibly draining, but this burnout felt different. It was like the, the life force had turned off and I felt a lot of frustration mm-hmm. in comes human design. And this yeah. thing reads me my freaking life. Yes. Like, <laughs> Every time I do a reading, so many people are like, are you in my head? How do you yeah. know this? It's just so uncanny. Yeah. It was by far the most accurate tool. Um, that I have ever come into contact with. And just from the first time that I got my initial profile, a lot of it was just like over my head, a lot of the information I didn't understand at the time. But just seeing that the not self theme of a generator was frustration. I'm like, that's it. That's all I needed. (laughs) This is me 
tell me how to get out of this. Um, so it, it became such a powerful tool for me to start making shifts in, in how I was operating in my business. I was still adopting a lot of like the things that I learned trying to be the perfect student and then the perfect corporate employee. And, you know, there was a lot that had to shift and move there. And then I, as I was going through my human design reader training, I was like, yo, this is such a cool tool to start bringing in to help clients get this personalized snapshot into their gifts, how energy moves through their body, how they're meant to express themselves, how mm -hmm. they're meant to like just navigate decision-making, but also in their messaging. Like, are you meant to have a firm point of view? Are you not? Um, mm -hmm. What? How's the energy in your throat center looking like? It, it was just such a world for me. So it kind of felt natural to start bringing that into my business because it was so useful for me. And it's like, we all know that feeling where we're like, oh my gosh, this has helped me so much. I have to bring this for my clients because like, this is the best. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and that's exactly yeah, how natural. my journey was with it as well, was just understanding it for myself and then realizing what an impact it had on me, my business, the way that I showed up in the world, my communication, my energy, my resonance. And then I just knew that it was a tool that I needed to help other people with because of the profound shift that it had for me. But circling back to your story as well, and thank you for sharing that. How did you then go from that to feeling like you weren't able to express yourself in the world to now being so confident and articulate what did you find that worked for you in that process and was human design a part of that too yeah human design was definitely a big part in just not making myself wrong and that's the biggest thing that I see whether I'm doing you know a reading um or I'm just with a client I'm like I'm curious let me see your human design and I pull that up and we start having that conversation through the lens of this tool is people people's eyes light up because they're like oh I've always known that about myself but knowing that that's intentional it just frees them it frees yeah. this level of shame over like oh that's not wrong this thing about me is not wrong um so I think that was the biggest thing that it gave me was understanding with you know a, a physical representation of how energy moves through my body allowing me to understand that it's intentional and you know I'm a person of faith and and I think that it's also a tool that brought me closer to God to have just so much reverence for how he creates all of us um but really I think the biggest catalyst for activating my real voice because you know I've, I've kind of put on different voices and I do have an undefined throat center but uh, you know, in the corporate space, I always felt like I had to show up in an uber professional tone down my accent yeah. type of expression. <laughs> and then starting my business, you know, I, I thought that I had to show up a certain way and, and speak professional business jargon and just mm. show up, you know, super polished and refined. So that was blocking a lot of my authentic expression. Like I'm naturally kind of playful. I like kind of inserting references and seeing if anybody understands what I'm saying. And like, <laughs> there's just certain quirks to my expression that I didn't even know were possible until I started dipping into somatic work. Yes. Uh, Body-based healing work and beginning to address the different layers of beliefs that were silencing me because of messages that I had adopted, whether because it was things done to me or just circumstances that I was present for that I then made mean certain things about me firming up in the world, me speaking up, me taking shape, um, me being fully expressed and seen. And that was just so transformational for me because it was powerful for me to actually feel feel through those emotions in a safe way for the first time and not shut myself down from them and not run yeah. from them. And the more that I did that, the more that I just felt this, this freedom, this liberation, no pun intended, but also pun intended <laughs> <laughs> to know that it's safe to be me in the world. And that, yeah. that belief was really the catalyst that allowed me to then show up more not even more powerfully, just like, just with less pressure of having to be perfect all the time. And what if I don't say the right thing? And is, is my authentic expression? Is it powerful enough? Is, is this enough? Is it that enough? Like, do I have to be this extroverted person when I'm definitely not like, 
it just allowed me to settle into the safety of who I am and who God made me to be. And then marketing just became so much more natural and innate and like a ticket to, to be who I was. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many things you just said that I love and want to touch on. (laughs) The first thing is around the somatic healing and that being such a profound impact on your voice. Same here. That's literally how I became a breathwork practitioner is because my own journey with breathwork is for sure the foundation of why I'm able to speak and communicate today. Because prior to doing that somatic healing, I could not even stand up in front of a small group and introduce myself without shaking. Like I was oh my so gosh, yes, terrified. It took me seven hours to get on my first Facebook live. There was just so much resistance to speaking. I remember the first time I did an Instagram story, I had to do a black and white filter because I'd broken out in a heat rash. Like there was so much fear around speaking. And then I went on a week long breathwork retreat. And by the end of that, my posture had changed. The tone of my voice had changed. And I didn't even realize until I had someone reflect back to me that I hadn't seen in a while. And she said, that shake in your voice is gone. And I'm thinking, what shake? (laughs) Because I didn't know but I had an anxious quiver in my voice when I was speaking even to people that I knew. So the experiences that I had had in my life that caused me to shut my voice down, which as a manifester as well, like that's oh my gosh, quite, yeah, quite literally my superpower to speak. That's how I shape the world around me and how I make my impact. So for me to move through so much of the layers that I was holding onto in my body allowed me to have the somatic confidence to speak and then human design just cemented that for me as well exactly yeah yeah somatic the somatic work definitely um came in first and it gave me the boost that I needed but I still I have marketing to thank for that because honestly if I didn't have the the cat like the trigger of marketing staring at me in the face (laughs) like I wouldn't have I don't know if I would have done that work. And for the first time in my life, there was something important enough to, for me to actually face it, you know, like marketing was so daunting and like girl, same, like every time I would go live for the first few like months of my business, I wouldn't sleep the night before I was like going over my script in my head, like so nervous. Um, And, but for the first time, I was kind of faced with like, well, I care about this work enough that I'm willing to work through this. And I know there's something different on the other side. Somatic work really unlocked that for me. And when human design came into my life, it was like a further confirmation of like, all right, you've done this healing work. Here's like your blueprint. Here's how to take this to the next level. Here's how to implement this into your business and into your life Uh, to the point where my fiance is a manifesting generator and to the point where he knows like he can't just ask me where do you want to go eat today I'm like no you know I need to respond so you need to give me ans- like you need to give me options <laughs> or else or he'll say okay what don't you want and I'll be like okay that I can work from <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can like transform my relationship um and save those many fights on a Friday night because I can't decide what I want to <laughs> eat. But yeah, it's it's been an incredible journey. And I'm like, the most emotional thing for me is doing those journal prompts where like you go back and you talk to your uh, child self or like a previous yeah. version of myself. And I always bawl because I know she would just be uh, just scared, shitless, but also so amazed at yeah. what we do now. Do you know what's so interesting? You're the third person that I've interviewed for the podcast that's brought up the inner child. So this is really reinforcing, I think, for all listening. (laughs) There is something here for us to do. I've said it before. I'll say it again. There's something here for us. But I'd love to just even highlight the fact that you and I both have, you have an undefined throat. I have a defined throat, but it hasn't necessarily been a different journey with then using our voice. And I think that is for me, what I've observed is that the throat center in human design really is one of the most shadowy centers in general, whether you're defined or undefined. And I think the biggest misconception when people see their charts is when they see that they have a defined throat, they assume that they should be naturally good at using their voice. 
And when people have an undefined throat, there's a fear there that maybe they're not meant to use their voice in the same way. And I always say we're all meant to use our voice for the things that matter to us and in our own way. But there is a different tone that comes with the throat when you have a defined or undefined. And I think you kind of touched on before when you tried on different voices and there is that spontaneity and fluidity that is the power of the undefined throat. And then there's that solid stream of a specific tone when it comes to the defined throat. But I think that using our voice is still a journey regardless. Oh, absolutely. And I love that point that you bring up because, yeah, I always tell people like, don't use your design against you. Like your desires are exactly it. Like Mm. you're not allowed to bring a desire in front of me and then say, oh, but because of my design, I'm not allowed to like, yes. People say, well, I'm a projector, so I can't initiate my business. I can't start. I'm like, what? what? Like, no, get start that <laughs> business, girl. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, mm. I think it's we have to we have to be careful with that, not using our designs are against us, but instead using it as a way to align with whatever it is that we are called to do. And yeah, for me, it's been interesting because as I've been exploring different speaking avenues. And knowing that I have an undefined throat, a big part of that journey has been trusting that I'll kind of pick up and sense the energy of the room and my tone will kind of match accordingly. Mm. And that I had to confront my inner over preparer and like perfectionist and needing to know every single word. And, you know, that was really my anxiety of not feeling secure and settled in my voice and in just, you know, coming into a room and feeling safe to be expressed in that way. But the more that the somatic work has allowed me to settle into groundedness and and enter into a room and kind of feel anchored in my, just in safety of my expression, the more that I've been able to notice that that gift, that play of just being able to express things in a different way or I'll mm-hmm. enter a room and my tone of voice will kind of change, but it works. And I've seen people like kind of nodding their head. I'm like, all right, I don't know where that came from, but hey, it's working. Yes. Um, so that's been a really beautiful journey too, of just trusting the the superpower of the undefined throat. Yeah. And that's what I always tell people in readings when they have an undefined throat is your power is to be able to walk into many different rooms and be able to adjust the tone to reach the ears that are there. Mine is the same no matter where I am. And, you know, I also have a defined identity center with the channel of inspiration that connects it. So it's a very authentic individual style of expression, especially with that manifest energy behind it. And so when I had first actually started the path that I'm on now, my initial impulse was to go into youth mentoring And then I realized that I probably wasn't going to be parent friendly because I wasn't going to be able to adjust my messaging and my tone. And I would probably say things that maybe the parents didn't approve of, like, nah, don't go to uni, like do whatever you want. So I knew I wouldn't be able to hold myself back in that regard and I would need to speak authentically. So I thought best go with adults and (laughs) led me on this journey now. But I also wanted to speak into the marketing component because I think that a lot has shifted and changed in the online space over the last few years. And I also think that a lot of what I have seen change has also been around the marketing piece. I think there's been so many people, like you said, that have used marketing as a manipulation tool and have gained a lot of success off the back of good marketing but not being able to hold the quality of service that is promised in that marketing. And so I think it's made people who maybe have a good service think, well, I don't want to be like that. So then there's a fear around marketing or resistance around marketing themselves in a certain way because they don't want to come across like the people they've seen do it well. Same with sales. What has been your relationship shift with marketing And what would you say to people to start to embrace that, as you said, as a liberation tool? Yeah, this is such a good topic and so relevant because I know that this is so prevalent. And, you know, even in the coaching industry, it kind of feels like a lot of people have been, quote unquote, coming for some of the bigger brands and integrity has been questioned and all of that. And I know that there has been a lot of fear of, just putting yourself out there and 
um, seeing marketing as this like dangerous thing. But I know that at the end of the day, the people that are truly in integrity, like you, at the end of the day, you love what you do so much that I would bet it's even more painful to not share about it than it is mm-hmm. to share about it. And marketing is this blank canvas that you get to decide how you want to wield this power that you have. And like, it's, it's a kind of like the that quote, like with great power comes great responsibility, but it's true, right? And some people out of their wounding, out of their anxiety, out of their feeling of insufficiency, out of their hunger, that they're only as worthy as their last achievement, that has is what has fueled the manipulation marketing that we have seen because the mm-hmm. business owner, the team or whatever is so in their wounding that they've had to use marketing as a way to perpetuate and play on people's wounding to get them to hand over their credit cards and enter the door, right? That definitely is there. But if you want to see some like real inspiring, can I curse on here? I think I've already cursed. Of course, yeah. (laughs) I think I've already cursed. I don't know if it's worth asking. It's a fully expressed um, podcast. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like look up some Nike campaigns like the Nike Unlock Your Greatness, I think it was called campaign. There is incredible marketing out there that has has spoken a greater message than just, hey, I want you to buy this thing. Mm. And I think the coaching industry can, can use more of that. How can we partner with marketing in a way where, yes, of course, you know, we want to have more visibility for our brand and we want to get our work into the hands of more people, of course. But what if we market in that that's not the only sole purpose of why we're showing up that day? We're mm. showing up that day to market a bigger movement that you're trying to create, a bigger message. And as a natural byproduct, your offers become the how, right? Your yeah. offers become that vehicle to help people get to, you know, whatever that the movement is is speaking about. So that's, for me, my marketing has been, for one, a healer for me. It's brought Mm -hmm. me back to myself. And I chose that intentionally because I was tired of marketing being the reason why I abandoned myself and why I felt like I had to put on these personas of like, you know, when you're launching and you feel like you have to be the person that's so excited to like sell something. I was just tired of that. I'm like, that's not me. So I decided that marketing was going to be the thing that turned me back to me and marketing was going to be the thing that allowed me to fully own my unique expression and that marketing was going to be the thing that allowed more unity in my brand and that brought people together and allowed them to see the bigger why. It's not just land into this coaching program. It's why. Why be in this coaching program? Why I don't know, do vocal activation technique with me. Why do this program? You know, there's a there's a bigger why. And that is what really gets that that devotion and that creativity back into play is if your why is too small, it's gonna feel like an option. But when your why is big enough, it's gonna feel like a necessity. Like you have yes. to get this out there. Oh my gosh, I'm obsessed with this. And I actually did a live probably about a year or more ago. And I spoke into exactly that. And one of the things that I spoke into was kind of like that hero's journey, right? It's like all the big movies that that we see, there's always that moment where they think they can't take another step and they almost quit. But it's their why for the mission that gets them up again and again and again and again and again. And I think that is probably one of the things that we've seen over the last few years is a lot of people entered the entrepreneurial space with a why that wasn't going to hold them through the low seasons or the valleys. And so this is a crazy ass journey. (laughs) You have to have a really big why that's going to compel you to keep going and just having the ability to have a laptop lifestyle or, you know, a certain amount in the bank isn't always going to cut it like just having that surface level there has to be a connection behind that why do you want the laptop lifestyle is it the freedom why do you want that money in the bank is it to retire your parents is it to you know have access to xyz like there's got to be a bigger why behind what we're doing and 
one of the things that I have in my chart is, you know, my primary purpose energy, but also another channel in my chart is all about the why and having to make everything have purpose and meaning. And so for me, I'm constantly reassessing my why. And sometimes my why will take me through a season and then I've got to reconnect into something bigger again and bigger again and bigger again. And it's just refining that to compel me to keep going. Yeah, so good. And and if I may, this is another topic that I'm like, we gotta be, we gotta be tying this in. With marketing, in the marketing of marketing, I guess we'll say in the coaching industry, in the service-based industry online, has for so long been about how easy can we make it and how automated can we make it? And if like you're efforting too much in your marketing, it's wrong and you need to pay me to make it easier. And and I know so many people too who are like, why just this week I was coaching somebody who was like, why does it take me two hours to write, you know, my post for the week? Like it's taking too long. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like this is this is an important part of our businesses. We have marketing, we have delivery, and we have sales. Like those are really the three core pieces of our business, right? So like marketing is you know, it's something that is worthy of us dedicating ourselves to. That's our message, that's our legacy. Like that's how I see it. That's my, that's the legacy of the Liberated Latina brand is how I message this and what I say and how I impact people and how my content, whether it's an Instagram post or a podcast, what does it leave people with? Mm. And it's, you know, it's okay to lean into that and to infuse more of your creativity because what you get in return, even Mm. from one post that is truly inspired is going to be so much bigger than churning out 10 days worth of posts that you just had chat GBT do for you or that I, you just threw out there. Like, <laughs> And this is something that I'm wildly passionate about is that aspect there. It's not having your work be the equivalent of a fast food chain. Like the idea of quantity that lacks substance and quality to me has never sat right for me. And obviously there's a lot in my design for why. <laughs> I would rather have infrequent content that I felt represented a part of my soul or felt quality. And sometimes that takes time. And I think this idea that speed is better when it comes to our creativity is a really weird thing. Like, would we have said to Van Gogh, can you hurry up and paint that just a little (laughs) bit faster? Like that's taking way too long. We need that on the wall by Friday. No. And the same thing with musicians. And they say to us, guys, the album's coming. It's taking a little bit longer, but it's going to be great when it gets here. Why can we not do the same thing as online service providers? Yes. Preach, preach, preach. (laughs) Yeah. Like sometimes Taylor Swift bangs out a song in a day, but I know sometimes it takes her weeks. So that's fine. Like, I, it's so interesting that you said the fast food chain because I shared about that in a post recently where it was like, your services are Michelin star. I yes. know. Like you put <laughs> your all in, and you have years of expertise. Like you want people to see your services as a Michelin star, but you're putting out this like fast food chain, junk food type of marketing. Like, or like you think that you have to just get things out there like a fast food chain, like just getting things out yes. there and And that's just not how it works. And then we wonder why people don't see the true Michelin star value of what we do. And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, it's up to us to show that. It's up to us to embody that, to create moving pieces of content. Like I'm sure, you know, Nike and Amazon and Disney, like they all have entire teams to put these things together. So it's okay if we need to spend a little bit more time curating that. Yeah. But even just this past year, you know, me as a generator, really prioritizing my joy and my creativity and play Mm. and rest, which for me, I thought for a long time, you know, I have all this energy, I don't need to rest. But like quality rest has, Mm. has been like the breeding ground for for content that has felt truly inspired. And those reels are still making its rounds, like people still find me from that, even if I don't post all the time. And that's, that's the power. And I think we're, especially now with the rise of AI and 
all of these different tools, it's not bad, but I think that it's never going to be a replacement for your voice. And when we give over the power of our voice to a software, that's modern day silencing, Mm. literally modern day silencing. And in the, you know, going into next year, when everyone's going to want to take that route, because they think it has to be easy. And they have chat GPT doing, you know, seven days worth of posts for them, and everyone's posting consistently. It's not going to be about consistency anymore. It's going to be about how poignant, how powerful can your content really be? Because at the end of the day, our marketing has to impact people and people need to feel something. People need to feel that like resonance with what you do. And I really believe that that can only be created when there's a human, you know, channeling that, creating that on the other side of the screen. A hundred percent. Could not agree more. (laughs) Said the same thing. And I actually said that I feel like now moving into the future, authentic human expression, especially the kind that connects emotively is going to be the highest form of currency because it's the same as when I remember being a kid and the, the things that, you know, that was when that modern, I guess, replication of things and the sort of, you know, came out as like the big, the big chain production of products came into play a lot more in, in my early childhood And I remember that it was really special to get a handcrafted good. You know, it was like you'd go to the markets or you would go to specific places to get handmade things. And it was like there was a slightly different price point, but it's like, but it's handmade. And I feel like that's going to be the same with our content is it's handmade or (laughs) human-made content rather than computer-made, which is the same mentality that it's that production quality. And I think that we can use that technology as what Gary V said is a thinking partner, which I like. It can be a thinking partner, especially if you've got an undefined head or an undefined Ajna, like I do, or both. <laughs> and then you can use that as like a helpful brainstorming tool, but then it's still connecting to you as the human to write it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, I like that term, a thinking partner. And it's also a great like productivity hack. Like I know for even the podcast headliner has that AI feature where it selects like 10 different segments of your podcast and creates an audiographic for you. Like that's amazing, right? But the 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 juice, like the actual human transmission of the podcast is still there. And then AI comes in to make things a little bit more seamless, a little bit more productive. Like that's great. But yeah, no way is it going to be a substitution of that human creativity and that human energy yeah and yeah it, it makes me think about like when I order things from Etsy versus ordering things from I don't know like Amazon or something and I'll order something on Etsy and you know it's crafted by somebody and they'll have like a handwritten note like thank you for shopping with me hope you enjoy yes. it I'm like, oh, gosh, this, is, this is luxury <laughs> like, yeah this is and that's what I do for my human design products is I write a handwritten note and put it in the box I pack it myself so it does have that, that real human touch as well So you've got three marketing archetypes that you work with. Can you give us an overview of what those are so that people can start to see how they can use this as a powerful tool? Yeah, we'll we'll go through it kind of quick, easy, breezy. But to give a little bit of context, the client attraction archetypes are something that I created um, because at the time, a lot of my clients were coming in and they had this fixed idea of like what their marketing had to be. Like I have to do for long form captions on Instagram and I have to do an email and I have to do uh you know things a certain way and before I even knew about human design I just noticed that there were depending on who I was working with we would just work with their what they wanted to do <laughs> like what they naturally felt inclined to do and what they felt naturally good at and we let that lead the marketing strategy once I found human design and I was going through my human design training, I took the archetypes and I was kind of making comparisons like, oh, that makes sense that this client felt most inclined to speak everything or speak into a like a software and have it be transcribed for them because they have so much energy going to their throat center. Like there were certain human design elements that really made sense. So yeah, the three client attraction archetypes. The first one, let's start with the speakers. I'm already talking about the speakers, but my speakers are the people that like can't be bothered with writing things out. Like they're usually the people that are voice memoing. 
instead of yes. text messaging or like on Instagram, <laughs> they're just like, you can just send you a voice memo because it's so much easier. That's uh, me. That's, yeah. <laughs> And people that would much rather, you know, be speaking than doing a bunch of content behind the computer. Um, and for my speakers, I always say, like, you can use any platform, but just make sure your voice is at the forefront. So what that look has looked like for my clients is, um, you know, you can do your email newsletter, but who says you have to type the whole thing? Like you can record a Loom video or something and embed mm -hmm. that into your email because that transmission of your voice is going to be so powerful and how fun to receive a video from like the person you're subscribed to. Like, that's so fun. Um, so just thinking about ways that you can integrate using your voice, no matter where you're showing up. Um, if you're on Instagram then doing those spoken reels and TikToks or um, looking to do like some sort of speaking tour as part of your launch. Like who said you have to do a bunch of content for your launch, just go on a speaking tour, you know, connect with your network, see who would have you come in and speak to their groups and have that be part of your launch plan. So those are something like fun ways that I've worked with my clients to kind of bring that speaker to the yeah. forefront, um, and just give them that, that creative boost and, and, Interestingly enough, that's when they have the most fun with their marketing because they feel yeah. like the energy that they're giving to the marketing is also giving back to them in the form of them being in that expression. Love that. Yeah. So those are my speakers, my creatives. So my creatives, I find that a lot of my creatives also have uh, a two in their profile because with the creative, you do your best processing when you're like in your creative layer, you need time to really process ideas, be in like your artistic vibes do your also writing resonate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do your writing by the way we can all have all three I yeah. kind of have all three in different proportions different seasons of my life um so my creatives you're usually the one that like really has always been an artist at heart you've always loved writing you've always kept those journals you're a painter mm. and or you're a singer artist of some sort that just that artistic element is in your blood and you do your best when you can kind of hermit out and be in your own space and create those works of art so for that I always say like with my clients who says that you have to just post a picture of you with your morning coffee on your Instagram like how can mm -hmm. we have your works of art lead you know how you market your offer so maybe it's um one of my clients was a therapist and a life coach but she also loved art so she started doing like art therapy with clients and part of her marketing was just her showing you know her drawing out anxiety her drawing yeah. out fears um and that was just a fun way to bring these two parts of her expression together but then it still kind of ultimately leads to you know the bigger mission of her brand and what her offers do and things like that yeah so it's interesting I feel like I definitely relate to that a lot I think the voice memo thing for sure in terms of friends but as my actual creative process, I much prefer the, you know, the hermiting and the writing and the processing behind the scenes. But it's interesting how you said about how to bring the art in, because one of my favorite things that I did last year was I actually did an Instagram art exhibition where I had a month around a theme of an idea. And I did this really creative reel that kind of set the tone for the whole exhibition. And then I did this little promotional tile where it was like I'd photoshopped myself into an art gallery with my own posts on the walls. Like it was just really fun. And that was awesome to kind of, that was my art, weaving the art in for sure. That's such a good example. Yeah. Like wherever we can bring that, you know, artistic element. And even for me as a generator, I have so much like creative energy that if I don't express it, it turns into that frustration or even like resentment. I become really mm -hmm. like closed off that life force isn't moving so I'm always like all right how do I bring the art form forward and I'm not necessarily a painter but I love writing so it's my cue to kind of go into my space um, I do have a two I'm a two four and I go into my space and I write everything out and I just play in the land of dreams and visions and words and then I let that energy come into you know whatever content or whatever mm -hmm. marketing I'm doing um, and last, we have my collaborators. My collaborators, you most likely have a four in your personality profile. You have the community channel. Uh, my collaborators are the people that like would much rather do a podcast or a, like a 
live with somebody else versus just going live by themselves Mm -hmm. they're usually all about amplifying other voices or they really have to feel connected to a group to a community in order to just like feel inspired Mm -hmm. Um, usually they're more like small group vibes. So speakers like are usually down for a bigger room. That's really exciting to them. Collaborators are more like, yeah, I want to just be with my people. I want to be in my network. I want to be with my community. Um, they do really well in intimate spaces. And for them, actually one of my clients, she was a four, six manifesting generator, but she loved networking, like literally loved networking and could not be bothered to sit behind a desk and like write out all this content so when she came to me she's like I bought this Instagram course but like I opened it and I just can't like I don't know how I'm gonna do this <laughs> I'm like okay so like what do you what do you love to do and she's like I love networking I love being with people I'm like great let's work with that mm-hmm. so she would just book herself up with networking events and chatting with people and she literally started her group program and filled it just through the contacts that she was making and the networking events that she was going to mm-hmm. and I mean, the networking is what allowed her to um, create small groups, create community, open the door to corporate contracts. So it was just such a beautiful way for her to stay in that element of a collaborator and not have to, you know, drown herself in this form of marketing that was just not going to be how her energy moved best. Yeah. Um, Whether it's networking or for my collaborators, whether it's creating community calls with you and your and your audience, I've done that a lot. I did like a sisterhood and somatics mastermind calls for my community. They were free. Um, anywhere where you can create those pockets of intimacy and community, you're going to shine <laughs> and you're going to feel the most safe to be, you know, fully expressed in what you're doing and what you're working on. And it's going to create that, that connection mm-hmm. that you actually need to feel in order to feel creative. Um, and, but it's also going to, of course, get the ball moving with getting word out there, opening doors to connections and, clients and all all the things oh I love that and I can mentally even just start to sift certain human design elements into those so I'm not surprised that you found that resonance to that as well so thank you for sharing those and so last question to finish us off what does being fully expressed mean to you You know, what immediately came to mind was not making myself wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, fully expressed has felt like honoring whatever is to be. If I'm feeling sad, to let myself feel that. If I'm feeling powerful, then to let that, you know, run its course. If I'm feeling powerless, that's not wrong. Yeah. You know, to have every element of expression have a seat at the table is to me the ultimate sign of liberation and freedom. Mm -hmm. Love it. Beautiful answer. Well, thank you, my love, for coming on and sharing today. I've absolutely adored this conversation. It was so much fun. I could keep you here for hours, but (laughs) I will let you go. And I will just strongly recommend that everyone reach out and connect to you as well. And I'll leave all of your information in the show notes. So thank you so much for being here. Gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. You're such a joy. And yeah, anybody listening, go hit me up on Instagram, say hi. I love DMS and chatting with people and I will most likely send, send you a voice memo. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This was such a blast. Thank you. Bye.